It came upon a midnight mare by Gregory Lane, the first 10 pages. Exterior, New York City, present day, Christmas Eve. Open on various shots of the city, a postcard of Christmas Eve in New York. Everything is cheerful, everyone is joyous, goodwill bubbling over in everyone, except one. Exterior, luxurious high-rise penthouse, balcony. A silhouette of a large figure leans on a balcony, eyeing the magnificent view. He brings the stub of a cigar to his lips, the tip flares. A perfect ring of smoke is released. Shifting his weight, he releases a long, loud, high-pitched fart, then flicks the cigar over the side and heads inside. Interior, penthouse, living room, continuous. Jacob Marley, mid-fifties, enters the living room. He is over six feet tall, stocky, with thinning hair, dressed in a silk robe, boxers, and a white t-shirt. He strolls across the room. As he makes his way to the wet bar, we get a tour of his home. It is expensive, classy, and modern. Interior, penthouse, master bedroom, continuous. Jacob enters the bedroom, which is extremely large. The TV plays a scene from Miracle on 34th Street, where Mr. Kringle protests, but I am Santa Claus. Lying on the floor, watching in her lingerie, is a very sexy young blonde woman, Courtney, 20s. Passed out next to her is an equally sexy brunette. He freezes in dread as the doorbell rings. Jacob panics. Courtney just keeps watching TV, unfazed. Fuck, you gotta be kidding me. On Christmas Eve, at 11 at night? Jacob jumps into action. He snaps his fingers rapidly as he tries to remember the girls' names. You, Lisa, Linda, Lorene, hurry, get hidden. Drunkenly and with no attempt to get up from watching the TV, it's Courtney. You don't care if it's Tina Tits or Julie Jizz. You girls need to hide. He opens a large walk-in closet and points, then tosses a few hundred dollar bills into it. Jacob frantically gets Courtney to her feet and grabs the other passed out girl by the leg. He pushes and drags them across the room as the doorbell rings again. He gets them into the closet with a shove. Stay hidden and silent. Interior penthouse living room continuous. Jacob collects himself and opens the front door, finding two cops standing in the doorway. Jacob grins, placing both hands in the doorframe, robe open, blocking the way. The two police, a man and a woman, look at him, unimpressed. Mr. Marley, Jacob Marley, we need to do a house search. Jacob just smirks, not moving. The cops, both in their late forties, grin as the female cop, Sally, slams her hand against Jacob's chest and with surprising strength, pushes him aside as they enter. Sally, a very attractive redhead, notably fit with an I don't take no shit attitude, eyes Jacob suspiciously. Sally looks Jacob dead in the eye and then down at his feet. He huffs knowingly and lifts his leg. Strapped to his ankle is a black gadget with a blinking green light. Don't I even get Christmas Eve off? These surprise visits are bullshit. The cops start to look around the apartment, searching. How do you think we feel? I would much rather be spiking a cup of cocoa, watching It's a Wonderful Life with my cat, rather than checking up on the biggest flight risk in the city. The male cop goes into the bedroom. Sally inspects the balcony as Jacob goes to the bar and makes himself a drink. You and just a cat? A hottie like you, all alone, stroking her pussy? Shame to do it all by yourself. Sally eyes Jacob seductively as she approaches him. He grins as she enticingly takes his drink from him raises it to her lips, and then in a snap, never breaking eye contact, pours it down his boxers. Mr. Marley, I understand your trial is going to start next week. I suggest you pull that humbug out of your ass, because when in jail, your cellmate is going to want it all to himself. All clean in the back. Okay, let's let Mr. Marley get back to jingling his bells. Jacob follows them to the door as they exit. He locks the door, then leans against it with a sigh of relief. He quickly heads to the bedroom, then pauses and shrugs, heading toward the balcony instead. The doorbell rings. Jacob, in mid-step, pissed off, storms to the door and flings it open, yelling, What the fuck do I have to... The doorway is empty. He looks right and left. There's no one. He shrugs, closing the door. A few seconds later, the doorbell rings again. Jacob, now very pissed off, marches back to the door. I swear my lawyers are going to... Again, no one at the door. The hallway is empty. 
He scratches his head. Behind him, he hears a creepy male voice. Marley. He looks behind him. The penthouse is empty. What the fuck? He closes the door, then slowly heads to the balcony. Behind him, the voice calls out. Marley. Freaked out, he halts. He turns around again. No one there. The voice calls out. This time it comes from the balcony. Jacob Marley. Jacob cautiously sneaks out onto the balcony. Exterior balcony continuous. Jacob, now shaking in fear, creeps step by step onto the balcony. His eyes dart around, searching. Sweat drips from his forehead. His hand clutches at his chest as he nears the railing. Coming from inside, behind him, the voice speaks again. Hello, Jacob Marley. Jacob's eyes widen. In a mighty effort of willpower, he turns. What he sees makes him go completely white. A very robust, fat man stands in the balcony doorway. His skin is chalky. He is dressed in a suit and tie covered in dust. Several links of chain hang all around him. The ghostly apparition raises its hand and points to Jacob, who reels backwards. His back is now against the railing. Petrified, shaking violently, Jacob just stares. Yes, it is I. Fezziwig, your old boss. I've been sent from beyond the grave to warn of what awaits you if you do not change your greedy ways. Jacob manages to give just one blink. Fezziwig steps closer. Tonight, you will be visited by three spirits of Christmas. They will teach you the true meaning of goodwill towards man. Something you lack in your black, cold heart. Jacob looks as if he's about to puke, as Fezziwig slowly steps closer, dragging the chains as he continues to explain. Expect the first spirit when the clock strikes twelve. That does it. Jacob snaps. He erupts in a scream as he explodes in total terror losing his wits and his equilibrium. Fezziwig is now the one in shock as Jacob backpedals, screaming with full momentum until his back is against the railing. But being tall, Jacob flips over the railing. A moment of silence and then a loud thud and crash are heard below. Fezziwig slowly walks to the edge, looks over the side and grimaces in disgust. Uh, dang, maybe I came on a bit too hard. Interior, penthouse, bedroom, closet, later that night. Inside the dark closet, Courtney and her passed-out psychic are dimly lit as she opens a slight crack in the closet door. Two male voices can be heard approaching the bedroom. I figured calling you would maybe help, or possibly fix the situation. Through the crack in the door, Courtney can see two men from the waist down. One man is in a suit in a black trench coat. The other is covered in dust, and dragging heavy chains. You thought right. They have no way of knowing what just occurred. What do I do? The first one will be arriving. It's, it's almost midnight. I will see to it that this mishap is corrected. Now quickly, head back. I'll attend to them. Courtney covers her mouth, trying to muffle the screen, as she watches a flame shoot up from the carpet at the chained man's feet. The flames open a hole in the floor, and Fezziwig falls through in a blur. The flames suck him down, and disappear with a small heap of vapor. The carpet returns to normal. She watches the other man climb onto the bed. The room is still and silent. Courtney finally exhales. Then from the bed, the man gives two quick hand claps, cut to black. Interior penthouse bedroom, sometime later that night. In the dark bedroom, the digital clock by the bedside turns to 1 a.m. The bedroom is slowly illuminated as a golden light appears on the floor in front of the bed. The light starts to solidify into the form of human feet. At the closet door, a pair of female eyes can be seen pressed right up to the crack as Courtney peers out. In front of the bed, we pan up from the feet to find a deep green robe trimmed in white fur, then a beard and green sparkling eyes in a rugged yet kind portly face. On his head, rests a crown of holly. It's the spirit of Christmas present, the character straight out of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. 
The overweight spirit looks around and sees a hidden individual lying trembling under the bed covers. The stocky spirit raises his hands toward the ceiling. A bright gold hue illuminates the bedroom as a banquet table full of food magically appears. Holly trims the walls and Christmas trees rise in the corner. Come out and throw me better, man. The figure under the sheet stops shuddering. Tis I, the spirit of Christmas present. You are foretold of my coming, and I, as my counterpart before me, the spirit of Christmas past, have come to help. The bed sheet starts to slide down. The spirit's smile fades into confusion. He looks harder at the person in the bed. You're not. What are you doing here? What's the meaning of this? How dare you interrupt my work? A sinister laugh bellows from the man in the trench coat. We still don't see him as he cracks his reply. <laughs> Your target just died. No misguided soul for you to save this year. Ha! <laughs> Goal on the scoreboard for team damnation. In fact, the three of you will never score again, this year or any other. Fear fills the spirit as he backs away, but it's too late. From the occupant of the bed, a bright electric streak, like a laser blast, strikes the Christmas spirit in the chest. The spirit is tossed into the Christmas tree. Panting for breath, he struggles, rising to his feet. At the foot of the bed, under the covers, several three-foot-tall, demonic, yet comical imps appear and attack the spirit. They tackle him, sending the giant man slamming into the banquet table. Food flies everywhere. He attempts to flick the imps off him like bugs. The spirit turns to face his attacker in the bed, but the unseen villain shoots out a red-hot glowing magic chain, which wraps itself around the spirit's arms. With hands tied, the spirit runs, just missing another energy blast from the bed as it hits the TV and explodes in flames. The spirit runs in the other direction, crushing the furniture in his path. More strikes blast the walls, just missing him, turning the bedroom into a shooting gallery. The imps continue to tackle him to no avail. The bedroom is completely smashed to bits in all areas but one, the closet door, with Courtney and her friend inside. The spirit almost reaches the exit, but a final bright electric streak strikes him in the back. Paralyzed, the spirit falls backwards, landing with a loud thud right next to the closet door, which pops open. Hearing muffled cries, the spirit turns his head towards the closet. His eyes widen when he sees the occupants of the closet. It's not just two women now, but three. Tied and gagged together in red glowing chains sits Courtney, her friend the brunette, and a lovely but scared spirit of Christmas past. In horror, the spirit of Christmas present's face is slowly shrouded in shadow as the dark figure comes to loom over him. Two down, one more to go. Secure him with the others and clean this place up quickly. The future will be here soon. Super one year later. Interior, Brooklyn Brownstone Apartment, Bedroom, Morning. A digital bedside clock displays the date, December 22nd, and turns to 6 a.m. The tune, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, starts to play. The bedroom is furnished in modest taste with framed posters of the 1930s cruise line travel advertisements hanging on the walls. From the bed, two male arms rise from the covers stretching to the ceiling with a yawn. The covers are flung off. A man leaps out, heads to the window, pulls back the curtains and opens it. His pajamas are playful, covered in cute snowmen. Douglas Scrooge puts his hands on his hips and breathes deeply. Doug, mid-fifties, has boyish good looks and a kind face. Exterior, Doug's home, morning, continuous. From across the street, Doug can be seen in his third-story window of a nice-looking brownstone building. He's all smiles as he takes in the sight of the new dawn. His building is covered to the max with every imaginable Christmas decoration. There is no question as to who has the most Christmas spirit on the block. Doug takes notice of a large hot dog delivery truck parked across the street. Along the side of the truck is printed, The Dog Dudes. Everybody wants some dudes meat in their mouth. He chuckles. Then, looking down, he sees a young man in his late teens, obviously homeless, with the looks of a junkie, going through the trash cans. Doug waves pleasantly, calling out to him. Morning, Andy. Andy looks up, smiles back, and returns the wave. Morning, Mr. Scrooge. Hey, look for the coffee can. Andy digs in the trash as Doug leans back in, the, closing the window. 
and he finds the coffee can and a $50 bill inside. Oh, if only the world was half as kind as Douglas Scrooge. Interior, Doug's home, morning. In the bathroom, Doug wipes steam off the mirror. He fills his hands with shaving cream, giving himself a Santa beard, and then speaks to his reflection. Oh, oh, oh. have you been a good boy, Douglas Scrooge? Or am I going to be putting coal in your stocking? Doug chuckles and proceeds to shave. In the bedroom, the closet door swings open to reveal Doug in the mirror, dressed in a sharp suit as he puts on his tie. Next to his dresser is a photo of a younger Doug with Jacob. In the living room, it looks as if a Christmas grenade went off. From elegant to tacky, the room drips with the holiday. A small dog, dressed in a holiday sweater, runs up a wide staircase to greet him. Doug lovingly picks him up. While singing, as if starring in a musical, from the top of the staircase, Doug dances his way down the steps with dog in hand. In a tap dance routine, he takes a few steps back up and then continues to dance down again. In the kitchen, Doug creates an elaborate breakfast as he skips about from refrigerator to stove. He wears a long apron that makes him look like a Christmas elf. In the dining room, he sits down at one end of a large eight-person dining table. He starts to eat and looks to the empty chairs around him, smirking a greeting to each of the absent occupants. Resigned to eating alone, he takes another bite. Doug reaches out to the center of the table trying to get the salt and pepper shakers, but they are out of reach. He rises to get the shakers, a porcelain salt Santa Claus who lovingly holds hands with a pepper Mrs. Claus. Reseated, he takes the salt, sprinkles it on his food and takes a bite. From the middle of the table, he sees Mrs. Claus lovingly smiling at him. Charmed, Doug smiles back, then discovers that Mrs. Claus is not looking at him. She is looking at her husband next to Doug. His smile weakens and disappears behind a cup of juice. Exterior, Doug's home, morning. Doug hums a merry tune as he leaves the building. He chuckles at finding the hot dog truck still parked across the street. He makes his way under the stone steps of the entry to the basement apartment door and knocks. The door opens. As the loud rock music blasts out, followed by a fog of smoke revealing Ryan, 23, who greets Doug with a smile and red glazed eyes. Yo, yo, Mr. S. They exchange a complex handshake that ends with a snap. Doug hands him the keys to his home. Ryan, can you take Sparky to the dog park today, in addition to his usual walk? I think he needs a play date. Oh, and check out his new sweater. Sure. Can't wait to see it. You know the young guy who seems a bit down on his luck, going through the trash cans? Andy's his name. Why, the homeless junkie kid? I guess. I'm curious, while I'm at work, has he ever taken up my offer to use my bathroom if in need? Or the shower and shave? I told him he can any time. Oh, yeah. Sorry I didn't mention it. Uh, he used the bathroom a few times. Uh, said it was much nicer than going behind a dumpster. Also, uh, made him some lunch. I hope that's okay. It's more than okay. I'm sure Andy was appreciative, as I am too. No sweat off my sack. I'm just dog sitting. Uh, Andy's one more pet, uh, just with a bit more fleas. They laugh while doing the handshake that ends with a snap.